It used to be that one did not have to use a fan in the summer times in, in Bangalore about 30 to 40 years back. We have seen in the last 20 years that there has been great uh, economic development happening, while at the same time a lot of the greenery of Bangalore has been disappearing. Now as a result, the summers in Bangalore are becoming much warmer uh, because of this development and the cutting down of the greenery, whereas now most people are using air conditioners in the summer. And when you have air conditioners being used in a city like Bangalore, uh, you have probably 10 times that amount of energy load on other cities which are much, much warmer and more humid than Bangalore. Now clearly, nobody will dispute that energy is the most important challenge facing the country. We estimate that for India to achieve reasonable living standards, nothing comparable to US, nothing comparable to European countries, but modest, reasonable standards, this energy supply should increase fourfold in the next two to three decades. We import 70% of all oil required in the country. Uh, it's a phenomenal economic burden on the country. But the other thing is, simply because we can afford to import them, we burn the oil. So now, you know, the focus is on, can we reduce that? Can it be used more efficiently? The aim of the research here is to build up the energy infrastructure which will have to exist by 2030 or 2050 uh, when the population of India is expected to touch about 1.6 billion. How do we meet the country's energy requirements? How do we meet energy requirements in a low carbon manner? And how do we ensure that energy supply is made available to all in a cost effective and equitable manner? The decentralized energy sector is often seen as a very small part of the Raja renewable energy space. This community is primarily dependent on kerosene for their lighting requirements. They have to charge their mobile phones in the nearest store. And for cooking, they're dependent on firewood that they have to purchase, unlike a lot of rural communities where it's freely available. Most households would spend about fifth to an eighth of their income just on these fuels and basic energy requirements. So when solar, decentralized solar energy comes in, it provides an alternative, a viable alternative, something that's financially sustainable, but also durable, um, and provides them an, a way to access brighter, better quality of lighting as well as mobile charging at their doorstep, reducing that expenditure on on kerosene and on mobile charging outside. So I think what C-STEP brings is that ability to connect what people are doing on the grassroots with what policymakers are thinking on top at the government levels, right? So it's able to act as that organization that connects these two entities without which it's very hard to transfer these learnings to the government. It's unlikely that you'll have people walk through settlements like this or fully understand exactly how this is happening. And having an organization like CSEP that can connect with these government entities, academic institutions, policy think tanks who are thinking about energy and bring in this perspective. Well, solar energy in a tropical country like India, which has good solar radiation, can be a very important source of energy. Some of the challenges are in acquiring land for those solar plants but also the financial potential of uh, being able to uh, generate enough revenue so that each solar plant becomes self-sustaining in a way. And I think that is where the uh, challenge lies right now in order to find innovative uh, financing schemes to make these solar power plants uh, more viable and bankable. When we look at solar energy and wind energy, these two forms of energy are complementary to each other and that India would require both of these forms of energy to grow rapidly. The overall wind potential in India, as estimated with today's technology and the turbine technology, is about 100,000 megawatts, out of which more than 20,000, about 20,000 megawatts have already been established on ground.
apart from the energy there is also infrastructure which is get which gets developed along with wind farms there are roads which which are developed uh, uh, specifically for for wind projects there are uh, health services which which also gets developed and this information in fact it is more useful to governments which actually can then plan the policies accordingly looking at the realistic wind potential and that's i think area where sistep has has worked very well they are basically trying to have a link between the industry and and the policy makers sitting in the government we have announced a dedicated uh, national solar mission and are in the process of formulating a national wind energy mission the expert group on low carbon strategy has set a goal for 2030 that one third of power in 2030 should come from non fossil fuel sources there is the sanskrit proverb that says if you want to know where you want to go first you know from where you have come we have come looking at energy as a unique opportunity for building india's economy economic growth and human welfare when you drive down and you see energy being used or channelized in something useful something as simple as uh, the rural level people able to watch cricket match or let's say international events thanks to some of the energy that has been you know channelized to them makes us feel very happy okay we are uh, in a very good area as the renewable sector grows and is poised for greater and greater growth uh, the importance of organizations like c step cannot be denied we see c step as a very important partner progressive modern minded Uh, who understand uh, the uh, the intricacies of renewable energy i feel very happy when there's a light in a house in the where there was darkness to say very very indirectly seastep has played an important role in doing that